Yeah, okay, I'm going to record. So tonight we are going to start with the talk by Sam Witherfin. Um, Sam is from uh, AI Dragon uh, from uh, Singapore and then he's also Google Developer Expert in Machine Learning. Uh, but um, I'll let Sam to introduce himself more. So time is yours, Sam. Thank you. Okay, I'm just trying to set this up so I can see people a bit and I can see the chat. If people want to ask questions at any time, feel free. Uh, okay, so hopefully people can hear me, uh, etc. I All right, so um, uh, good evening, everyone. I, I, it sounds like there's a bit of issues with Zoom, but okay, let's get started. I, so a bit about myself, I'm originally uh, from Australia, originally from Melbourne. Uh, I haven't lived there for a long, long time, uh, for about 25 years plus. I, but I, I grew up uh, quite a bit in Melbourne. Um, I, like, uh, so, so I, uh, like Eunice was just saying, um, I, I'm a Google developer expert for machine learning. Um, I was one of the first 12 uh, Google developer experts for machine learning and deep learning appointed in the world. Uh, and that's about five years ago now. Um, I work uh, sp specifically with deep learning uh, and mostly around things to do with language and dialogue systems uh, and also generative models. Uh, so uh, obviously tonight I'm talking a lot about generative models. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I also happen to organize the machine learning meetup in S Singapore. I, I, my background is in startups. Uh, I've built multiple startups. I've built two B2C startups with more than a million users. I, 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 you know, I've done a number of different things in that sort of area. I, for the past couple of years, I've been a mentor in Google for startups for North America and for Asia. Uh, and the current startup that uh, I've been working on for the past few years is a startup called Red Dragon uh, AI. So uh, Red Dragon does a bunch of things. Let me just show you uh, some things about us. So we were founded in 2017. We're a Google partner. Um, we do a bunch of things that relate to sort of consulting and prototyping uh, stuff for uh, Google customers and for other people. Um, we also do a lot of research. So we're in a lucky position where Google has sponsored some of our research. Um, we've had papers at NRIPS, at EMNLP, uh, at NACL, at quite a number of different conferences. Um, and one of the things that we're sort of heavily focused on at the moment is uh, very sort of the idea of advanced conversational AI and, and what we call digital personas. So this is using sort of generative models to create digital humans that people can then interact with. But, um, Eunice, do you want to let people in as they come in? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I'll take care of that. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, all right. So uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about generative models. And I'll tell you a little bit uh, about how this sort of talk came about. Um, so I, I can't actually see the participants. So we don't have like a hands up or anything like that. But I, th there's a conference I'm sure some of you know about the conference called NRIPS. Uh, which is run in, in sort of uh, December each year. Uh, for the past couple of years, it's been online uh, due to COVID. Uh, but this is sort of like the premier a, you know, AI or really machine learning uh, related con uh, you know, conference in the world. Uh, and um, for the past couple of years, one of the things that we, we, we attend this conference, we've had papers at the conference, and I always like to pick uh, at the end of each sort of conference like this, I pick a talk that I will give, which sort of sums up some of the new things that people were talking about and some of the general directions of things, where things are going with machine learning and deep learning uh, in this, this conference. And so uh, the, the you know, last NRIPS was in December 21, just a couple of months ago now. And one of the key things that became obvious to me was that there's definitely a lot happening in the, the space of generative modeling uh, here. So so, uh, oh, okay, I see someone saying that we host the, the NRIPS remote locally. Okay, great, fantastic. So I'm wrapped that you guys know what it is, right? I, okay, so I, I, I'm going to talk about, you know, not just papers from NRIPS, but also uh, some things that have been since NRIPS, uh, and also just some of the sort of general field of this, you know, uh, idea of generative modeling. 
Yeah. So this sort of brings about the first question, which is, you know, what is generative modeling? I, so I would say, you know, uh, the definition I'm going to sort of give or the things I'm going to talk about tonight is we're generally talking about a deep neural network. Uh, and we're talking about something that's trained to generate some form of output. Uh, this could be an image, it could be sound, it could be you know, a variety of different things. Uh, it's, it's quite a different model than say a classification model or a regression model here. Uh, we're definitely you know, doing uh, quite a, a large output usually in some way. And the goal with this is normally that we're trying to learn a distribution of underlying data so that we can then generate samples from that data distribution in a way that would be uh, something that maybe is, is completely new, but could have come from that data distribution. So the classic example that you'll see that I'll show a, a few examples of tonight would be faces, right? A lot of people have done the, you know, this person does not exist sort of thing. Uh, and in that case, you're basically training on uh, a data set of you know, a few hundred thousand faces, uh, and then you're trying to generate new faces that are not in the data set, but could have been in the data set. So this is definitely a challenging uh, sort of task because you know, we've got a whole bunch of things in that data that is, you know, that makes it very difficult to model. Um, and, and we also then need to model it in a way that we're sampling one example from that. So we don't want, for example, just to be able to sample things that are the mean of it or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the last thing that, that I would say that has become sort of standard in generative modeling is that we often want to condition the output so that we can guide this generation. So rather than just, you know, have it generate, uh, you know, if we're talking about, say, MNIST, you know, MNIST digits, rather than just generating any MNIST digit, we want to be able to tell it, right, we want you to generate just number sevens. And we guide it in some way, uh, you know, for, for that kind of thing. I, so this is sort of, you know, what we're, we're talking about tonight. I, all right, so types of generative modeling. There are a lot of different types of generative modeling. Uh, these, these range, you know, uh, a variety of different techniques from things, you know, that started 10 years ago to things that are literally only, you know, a, a year or two old uh, for some of this stuff. Tonight, I'm gonna focus on four main areas of generative modeling. I'm gonna look at uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks, which I'm guessing quite a few of you already know about already. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about very variational autoencoders, which is an idea that was popular, uh, you know, going back sort of eight, nine years ago, uh, and has sort of come back in a different form now. Um, I'm going to talk about diffusion models, which is a new, uh, a much newer version of uh, generative modeling. And I'm also going to talk about neural radiance fields. So I'm going to leave out some of the other stuff like autoregressive models would be things like, you know, your GPT uh, language models and stuff like that, where you're predicting something in sequence. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, normalizing flows or score matching models. These are also really interesting things just for time's sake. Uh, I'm going to sort of focus in on these four areas. I'm going to start off though by talking about some general trends that we're sort of seeing. So in the past, you would have generated, you know, you would have seen papers like this, where people were, you know, generating MNIST, and I presume everyone knows MNIST. By the way, if you, if anyone wants to ask a question, feel free to ask questions. I can see the chat as we're going along. But in the past, you know, people would have generated things like MNIST. Um, uh, they would have generated very low resolution faces, this, these kind of ideas. And this was state of the art, uh, you know, less than 10 years ago. <clears throat> so it does, I just want to sort of set the bar of where we've been and, and where we, we've sort of come from. Uh, in, if we're looking at GANs specifically, we sort of saw that in 2014, you know, at best we could do something in black and white. By sort of 2016, 2017, we could then do color faces. Uh, by 2017, uh, we actually then started to see 
uh, sort of the precursors to the style GANs, which was the progressively growing GAN, this one on the right here, which actually started to bring about photorealistic uh, generation here. Uh, and it was still very limited in what you could do, still flawed in many ways. Uh, but we, we actually then started to get into, you know, and this is literally only five years or less than five years ago. Uh, so some general trends that we're seeing is that Definitely quality is getting better and better. Um, but beyond this now, now that sort of the photorealistic thing has been achieved, people are much more interested in, okay, where do we go for the next step for this? And part of that is going to be things like multimodal models. Uh, and part of that is going to be a lot to do with guided generation. So I'll talk about, you know, some of the techniques that people are using for these things. So multimodal is one that's very, um, uh, is very hot at the moment. Uh, so here are sort of three models that focus in on uh, multimodal stuff. Uh, we have the newer model, which I'll talk about later on in the talk uh, from Microsoft Research Asia, uh, which just came out uh, very recently. And um, we have DALI Clip and Clip uh, from OpenAI. So you can see here we're generating, uh, you know, uh, things that uh, these, all these models are starting to use not just images as a modality, but often text and other things as, as a modality. Um, at Google, uh, Google's basically got the, the uh, MUM model or the you know, uh, multi-unified uh, multitask models. Um, these uh, are not generative per se, uh, but they're being used for a lot of different things uh, like, you know, uh, search and stuff like that, where people are looking at doing uh, things that are multimodal and not just, uh, you know, purely text-based or something like that. Another key thing is the, the guided idea, uh, the guided generation. So when we look at the, the guided generation, we're definitely seeing, you know, huge changes in the past year or two uh, for this. So uh, there are sort of four main ways that you can do guided generation. Uh, the first one is relates to sort of latent codes or, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll look at this when we, we sort of look at some of these things in depth as we go through. Um, this is basically where you've got a continuous vector uh, that you're using some noise or something like that to feed into a generator, have the generator then be able to do stuff. Uh, this can be guided in many ways, and I'll talk about that. Beyond that now, we're starting to see things like text prompts. So the lower left image here is from DALI, uh, and this is basically using a text prompt where you can actually guide the generation with saying something like an armchair in the shape of an avocado, and it is actually able to produce uh, things like this, even though these were not real images from the training set, et cetera. Now, these are probably very cherry picked uh, from the, the overall thing, but it's still pretty amazing that it can do this. Um, some other ways we're seeing that, you know, people are guiding generation would be things like masking and sketching. So the top right here of where you, you know, this picture originally had a person uh, walking along, holding a surfboard. If we just sort of mask them out, uh, and then regenerate, we can basically just take them out of a scene. This has become a very you know, popular technique to use. Uh, and then another one that we sort of see is where you see image prompts used. Uh, so here we, we can see that this is sort of like a, a, a GPT style model uh, where you're basically saying, okay, uh, I'm gonna feed it in an image as a prompt, but I'm also gonna give it some text here and I'm telling it that I want the exact same image as I'm feeding in, but I want you to sketch it. And you can see that the, the model is able then to basically sketch out, you know, different examples. So this is what we refer to as sort of guided generation. Another thing I'm going to sort of set up is, you know, it's just some evaluating you know, criteria for evaluating uh, these things. So the things I would say that you want to keep looking out for in generative models is, okay, how is the generation done? Uh, how efficient is the generation? And how can the generation be guided? So, uh, there, you'll see that there are many techniques uh, for how these things are done. And there are techniques that end up popping up in multiple uh, scenarios over multiple years as well. So the first one I'm going to talk about is GANs. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that most people have a reasonable idea of what GANs are. Uh, if you don't, uh, just very briefly, 
Uh, again, is where we sort of set up two networks. We have a discriminating network and a generating network. And we have this adversarial relationship of where these are basically fighting uh, against each other. Um, they, the generator makes some data. We then present some real data and uh, generated data to the discriminator. It has to be able to tell the difference between these. Right. And you, you want this sort of balance with these things. Uh, the goal with this kind of thing is not necessarily to bring a loss to zero, like in a, a, a normal sort of model. We want this sort of balance of where sometimes the, the discriminator wins, sometimes the generator wins, but overall they're both getting stronger. Uh, and this, this can be really you know, difficult to sort of do. Uh, and it took a long time for people to work out ways to do this. One of the, the sort of best examples of this has been the style GANs. <coughs> so these came out of uh, NVIDIA, really starting with the precursor to the style GANs uh, in 2017, the one I talked about before, the progressively growing GAN. Uh, but the, the original style GAN came out in 2018. Uh, and this was, you know, uh, probably the first model that you could just generate totally large amounts of images of human faces uh, and people really couldn't tell the difference between these. Uh, it, you know, it's not like it was perfect. Um, there were some issues with this. So uh, this was sort of the first one to accurately create very high resolution images. I, it was a sequel to the progressively growing GAN. It uses a, a very high resolution uh, data set called the Flickr Faces data set. Um, it also works in other domains. So it's not just faces. Uh, one of the ones that I like a lot here is the, the idea of uh, these bedroom scenes. And if we look at the bedroom scenes, this is where we sort of see the strengths of a GAN here in that uh, this is not taking some sort of or anything in here. This is, uh, this is basically uh, what it's doing is it's looking at it and uh, generating something that it thinks would be there or not there. So you'll see, for example, uh, that like the curtains, there's never really half curtains. There is either curtains, you know, either are either there or they're not there. And the same is pretty true with the, the, you know, the paintings on the wall too. So we don't get these sort of blurred halfway sort of things. Uh, and this is one of the, the sort of things that set, you know, the early style GAN, uh, you know, uh, meet someone, um, set, set them apart from sort of what was going on uh, out there. The style GANs though uh, still had, you know, quite some major issues the, for the first one. And you would see these, what they were called droplet artifacts. So these are basically where, uh, what was happening is as the model was sort of upsizing the image, uh, it would not do a good uh, job at certain parts. And you would then see these artifacts. And if you knew what you were looking for, it's actually quite easy to tell the, you know, a style GAN, original style GAN image uh, from the real thing, you know, pretty easily. And certainly if you're trying to train a classifier, it can learn, you know, quite quickly how to do that. Um, so after that, they brought along style GAN too. So, this did away with a few different things. One of the key things though, was it introduced a new type of normalization uh, and it introduced, uh, it introduced a really good way of, uh, of handling the latent space a lot better. Now, I'm not gonna go into this uh, tonight. We don't really have time, but what it, it that did rather than just working in what we call Z latent space, it translates it to a, a more even, uh, latent space, and that allows for better interpolation, which means when we're taking that, that latent vector and interpolating between latent vectors, we can actually get much better images out uh, from this. And this is sort of, StyleGAN2 was the, the first one to really sort of move into this. And this became, uh, you know, this, this became sort of like a real trend that we sort of saw from this. So after this, we had uh, StyleGAN ADA, which was uh, an adaption to this. So StyleGAN2 is uh, roughly 2019, StyleGAN2 ADA is 2020, uh, and then StyleGAN3 was uh, 2021. And this was at uh, NRIPS uh, last year. Uh, and one of the things that this introduced, so this allowed it to sort of fix up a lot of the problems uh, that were still in style GAN 2. And one of those is that the, the GANs tended to be really good at 
sampling something. But if you move the latent space a little bit to try and move the image a little bit, uh, you would see flaws in this. So, uh, and the reason for those flaws was basically it, that they weren't, uh, StyleGAN 2, et cetera, wasn't equivariant to translation and rotation. So that's what StyleGAN 3 introduces to this. So it basically means, let me sort of show you what it, what it means in a picture rather than looking at something uh, text. And what it means that if you look at this guy on the, on the left here, you'll see that his beard doesn't really move. The text, this is what we call texture sticking. Uh, and it's just sort of sitting there. Let me just play that again. Where, where is, and it's just sitting, even though his face is moving behind it, where the guy on the right, the beard is moving you know, perfectly uh, with the face. So this is what happened in StyleGAN 2. Uh, and then StyleGAN 3, uh, you know, fix this up. So this is one of the key things uh, from the GANs. And it's not just, you know, this is the nice sort of way of seeing it. It turns out that this makes much better interpolations uh, as you're going through this stuff too. So that you could go from uh, one image uh, to, you know, translating through to other images in a much smoother context too, without weird artifacts. So StyleGAN 3 was definitely one of the interesting papers at NREPS uh, this past year. Um, it, and, and one of the things that I, I love about the NREPS conference, uh, and if you get a chance to sort of attend one online something, it's definitely worth uh, doing that, uh, is that they have poster sessions. And in the past, when you would go along to the physical conferences, uh, you know, it, it really can be... Um, you know, quite hectic in that you've got 90 minutes to go around and look at maybe 100 different posters. Uh, and, you know, and, and the popular posters will be have like 20, 30, 40 people around them uh, asking questions or looking at different things. I, the, the interesting thing is when they move this online, uh, they made a virtual sort of version of the, the, the poster thing and they just left them open for a few hours. And then the authors would just sort of sit there and take questions. And one of the great things with this is that you could go in and actually talk to these people. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, I'm very interested in GANs. Uh, I went along to the StarGAN3 things, talked to the, the authors quite a, uh, you know, for quite a while about not only uh, StarGAN3, uh, but more the directions of where this, you know, this whole thing was headed. And that's sort of what led me to this talk, actually, was that the interesting thing was that they were not as hot on some of the GAN stuff going forward, but they're now starting to look at, you know, other things uh, internally at NVIDIA. Uh, and uh, and you know, one of the authors actually said to me that, like, well, in many ways, the GANs is kind of getting to be a solved problem. Uh, that we can generate, you know, all these sorts of things. So I actually doubt we will see a style game four. I think you will see, you know, new things coming from this team, but not necessarily like this. So this style game, you know, is definitely one of the, the sort of key uh, things for this. Um, next, another paper that was in Rips, which was a GAN paper, is a, a cool little sort of trick, and this is called projected GAN. I uh, so. If you, if you do want to train GANs, if that's something that you're interested in, one of the things you'll know is that training up these models can take a long time. Uh, I've trained up quite a few style GANs and I'll normally leave them running with multiple V100s for you know, five days plus uh, to be able to get something that's, that's quite good uh, for this. So this paper really interested me because this is basically looking at how can you make GANs converge faster. And they've got a really nice little trick in here. <clears throat> and what they do is that they basically just created a better discriminator. And the, the, the discriminator, uh, I'm not going to go too much into the details. You can go and have a look at the paper and stuff yourself. But what the discriminator does is it looks at parts of the image uh, and it, you know, it, it looks at it looks at parts of the images in sort of patches. So that in itself is not a new thing. We've had this sort of idea of patch GAN in quite a thing for a while. But what this sort of does is take another network 
and and then passes it through that other network in these small patches uh, and then uses that to basically then predict, you know, the generated versus real as well there. And you can see that they actually do it at different layers in the network as well uh, for doing this. So they can actually do different predictions, uh, different sort of discriminators at different layers. Now, one of the cool things about this is that this model itself actually doesn't even need to be trained. You can actually just have random weights in there. And because it's sort of looking at a, a modified convolutional pattern, uh, that turns out that the random weights work fine because real images will have a certain pattern and fake images will have a, a different pattern. So obviously the closer the fakes get to the real, the more that that pattern will sort of fit. So it, this is kind of interesting. And they try out, you know, a number of different networks using VGGs and stuff like that there. Uh, uh, all right, so that that's project again. If you um, uh, if you see, uh, there's another one. Actually, I think I'd be, I might have a slide in here later on. There's a new model, a new model out from the same people. Uh, this that's getting quite popular over the past week or two, called um, StyleGAN XL, uh, and it's actually just StyleGAN three with this projected GAN trained up on ImageNet. Uh, so I think I've got a slide about it in here. All right, so GANs. One of the big things in GANs is really interesting is the guided generation. I, so I, it turns out that we're going to feed in these sort of vectors, normally something, you know, a vector that's sort of 512 long. Right? And what we would like to do is be able to sort of work out something about that vector. So uh, one of the ways that you can think about this, you know, I, I find, so it, for, for those of you who've worked with latent spaces, you'll know, you know, know this quite well. If you're new to this, just think about that. Uh, I always like to think of vectors as being, you know, locations in an n-dimensional universe. So if we've got a, you know, a three-dimensional, we've got a point in a three-dimensional space is a, a vector of three. If it's in five dimension, uh, 512 dimensional space, uh, you, know, you can think about it still in a point in space. I, and the interesting thing is that you can then manipulate those, those areas tend to produce certain things. Now, one of the interesting things is it's not like uh, one of the, the flaws that a lot of people think is, well, okay, uh, if I want to disentangle the semantic representation here, maybe this, this you know, uh, number here is going to represent, you know, smiling or not smiling. And it turns out that it doesn't actually work like that, right? That these are not disentangled representations uh, in the sense of, of along these axes that we have here. What it actually works out is in directions. So if you think about it, you know, a 512 dimensional uh, vector, we've got a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of different directions that we can push in and different directions can produce things, can make changes, things like a smile, uh, like the gender, uh, and we can then sort of translate through, uh, you know, from one point in space to another point to generate, you know, lots of images for doing this. So the idea of projections is a, a, a really key thing uh, in GANs. Now, some of you, I'm sure, have, have experimented with this quite a bit before, and some of you might find it, you know, new. Right. But the, the idea is that if we want to, you know, if we want to find things in GANs, we've got to basically work out the projection by manipulating this latent vector. One of the best ways that we can do this is to basically uh, take a loss against the latent vector, not against the weights of the model. So that allows us to do things like what th this, uh, um, this paper uh, introduced, and actually this idea has been around for a while. This is just a much more efficient way of doing it, of where <coughs> you basically have a, an image uh, and you then feed it, uh, you in, in this case, through an encoder to get a, a latent vector. And then you use that latent vector to project out through the style GAN, and you then take a loss against the images. And what this paper basically improved this, you know, uh, by an order of magnitude. So in the past, this would take a long time to do, uh, to be able to find a picture of someone in a style GAN kind of thing. Uh, now you can do this, you know, very quickly. You can go through it. Um, ha have a look. I've put a, a, you know, link to the demo there. It's it's quite nice that you can basically just, up, you know, upload a, an image and you'll see that it'll find the closest match in one of these style GAN models. Uh, and really what it's doing is it's finding 
finding the latent representation or that latent vector that represents that image. And once we've got that, we can play around with a lot of things. So if you see a lot of things of where uh, people are, you know, taking a picture of someone and aging them, that can be done by this sort of thing, where we basically uh, find the, 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 the latent vector for the person, we then find the direction for aging, uh, and we just move the, uh, the vector along uh, in that direction. Uh, and that turns out to be a really, you know, uh, a really useful task. Another one that's become a really cool sort of guiding, uh, guided generation task uh, is this idea of clip. So I, I can't see, unfortunately, when I do it on the webinar one, I can see people's hands, if people put their hands up. But anyway, I hope, I'm sure some of you have heard of CLIP. So <clears throat> this is basically a model that came out of uh, OpenAI about a year back now. Uh, and what this is basically all about is doing sort of, you know, uh, they call it, you know, stands for contrastive language uh, image pre-training. Really what it was, was that you want to match up embeddings of text and images uh, so that you can use uh, at text to predict an image and images to predict the text uh, for this. So they trained up on about 400 million uh, images and text pairs uh, from scraping the internet. Uh, and what it allows us to do is it allows us to then take a loss between uh, an image and some text. And then we can manipulate the image by changing the text. So the text produces an embedding. We can then use that embedding uh, to manipulate the image uh, based on the model that we've trained it on. So uh, this is a really nice, uh, you know, a, a really nice technique. And uh, it came out from originally from OpenAI, but very quickly, you know, last year it made its way into uh, the sort of StyleGAN world. Uh, and this is, you know, called Style Clip. And what it allowed you to do was basically find a projection of a person and then uh, take that projection and say, right, I want this image, but I want to manipulate it with some text. So you can see here that they're doing things like, uh, you know, putting an image of a person in and saying, okay, I want the hairstyle to be a mohawk and it can take, you know, a picture of Obama and move it. Now you've got to understand it's not doing it where it's just changing the hair, it's changing the whole vector. Uh, and so it's so you will see some changes in other parts of the face to keep it consistent. Um, <coughs> this is kind of interesting uh, that supposedly this cat is not a cute cat and this cat is a cute cat. Um, so it tells us a little bit about what people think is cute, maybe big eyes, uh, this kind of thing. Um, I, I played around a lot with this when this, this came out. And one of the things that, you know, uh, uh, we were sort of very interested in is like, okay, what could you do with people? And what did it know about people? So generating things from scratch, uh, here's you know, images that I generated. Uh, and this is one of the things that I was really interested to try was one, does it actually know some people? Well, it clearly seems to know Elon Musk, right? So the one on the left is uh, an oil painting of Elon Musk. And uh, this doesn't, you know, exist anywhere. It's basically just, uh, you know, using, it's got an understanding or it's got a representation. When I say understanding, I should be very careful about that, but it's got a representation of uh, a vector of what you need to do to a vector to make it an oil painting. And then it's able to find some sort of vector that represents this thing called Elon Musk. Uh, and can do that. The thing that's really funny is that then you can say things like, okay, I would like an Asian Elon Musk or an Asian young Elon Musk. Uh, and it can then basically, uh, you know, generate something that it believes still has parts of the Elon Musk vector, but also has parts of other conditional vectors as well. So this is sort of a fun thing to, to do. You can you know, play around with this. I knew again, right? Um, one of the ones that's come out since NREPS, and actually we, we spoke, talking with the, the StyleGAN authors, um, we spoke extensively about this. The paper for this is still not out. Um, I think it will come out in the next month or so. Uh, and this is GalGAN2. And what this does is pretty cool. So let me just turn off the, the thing. So this basically allows you to take an image 
and then manipulate this with uh, text. So it's doing a similar kind of thing. Uh, it's not actually using clip per se, but it's using something like it. Uh, and uh, you can see that it, it can then basically generate things where you could take a, a picture and say, all right, I want, it, I want this in fog or I want this in uh, you know, something else. Uh, and it can do this. So it can also do uh, the masking idea. So where we can say, right, this is a mask, like a semantic segmentation mask here. And I want you to tur turn this into uh, an image of a mountain. And you can see that sure enough, it can, it can work that out, you know, and, and do that. Uh, and then it, then it can start playing with it. All right, I want it to be cloudy or I want it to be rainy, or I want it to be sunny, etc. cetera. So this is, uh, this is an interesting thing from a few points of view. One of the things that was uh, interesting about the style, talking to the StyleGAN authors, was that actually GANs haven't made a huge headway into sort of industry. Um, they're used for certain techniques and stuff like that, but uh, they're not, they haven't been used a lot. The idea is here is that Gaogan 2 will you know, open this up a, a lot to different uh, things um, and allow people to use this in much more sort of generative art way of where you will probably see this make its way into Photoshop is my guess uh, with this kind of thing. All right. All right, so uh, that's Gaogan 2. Another one is uh, the, another one that came out just recently is uh, uh, Stitch It in Time. So this is basically, again, using a guided generation on a style GAN uh, to manipulate the, the, the video in some way where it's going to be consistent. So you can see here, unfortunately, this is not, uh, it's not in real time. Uh, it's a bit misleading how they say real videos. I'm not sure what a, you know. Uh, um, anyway, they, uh, you can see that it is pretty cool though that you can, you know, you can take something like this and we can say, uh, we can do uh, sort of the, the visual version of prosody where we can actually change the emotion and stuff like that. We can change age, we can do these things. So using a 2080, these take, I think about 30 minutes or so. Uh, it's certainly not real time uh, for doing this yet, but it shows you, you know, uh, it is definitely a step, uh, you know, that's really interesting uh, for this. Um, another one I mentioned before, so from the Projector GAN guys, uh, they've gone and done one, uh, which is modeling ImageNet. Uh, this is kind of nice. Uh, um, and you can see that this sort of, uh, this, where, where we're sort of moving the, the dog around is this is a clear sign of that this is StyleGAN 3. Um, anyway, but the, this style, uh, this StyleGAN XL is, is ideally, you know, ideally trying to model all of ImageNet. Uh, I'll show you some, some models later that I think are actually better than GANs at this uh, nowadays. Uh, but this one's interesting. Um, it does seem to me that this paper really just seems to be more of, you know, the same sort of projected GAN, but on a different data set. Anyway, uh, let's move on to VAEs. So uh, I'm guessing, you know, for those of you who've been in the deep learning community for a while, will remember autoencoders uh, and uh, variational autoencoders. Um, these were very popular, uh, you know, VAEs originally came out around sort of 2013, 2014. Um, up until the GANs sort of hit photorealism, uh, the VAEs were still considered like, oh, you know, this might be one of the ways that works. And then once, uh, you know, once the GANs sort of hit their stride, people kind of put VAEs to the side. Uh, and it's only just recently that people started to come back to this. So if you don't know what a variational autoencoder is, We've basically got an encoder uh, network on one side, a decoder network on one side, and we're basically trying to build a bottleneck. Uh, and if it was just a normal autoencoder, we would just have a single latent dimension in here. Uh, and we go for a bottleneck going down to this latent dimension and then coming up the other side. I, what a VAE does that's different, just briefly is that we're basically going to make a distribution. So we're going to have a, sort of a vector of means on one side and a vector of standard deviations on another side. And then we can actually do a, a little trick called the reparameterization trick, which allows us then to sample out of these uh, two vectors and create something that we can then feed back into the decoder network to generate. Now, uh, early on, this, you know, 
wasn't that great. Sort of like, you know, people kind of abandoned and, and walked away from these things. Um, because what they would do is they would build images like this that were still quite blurry. There really wasn't a good way of getting um, the sort of crispness that the GANs had got. Uh, you know, this, this was still sort of a flaw. And this was kind of up until, uh, you know, some deep mind came along and introduced this idea of a vector quantized uh, VAE. So what is this vector quantized thing? So rather than sort of bring it down to, to a distribution of mean and standard deviation, what the vector quantized idea does is it basically decodes it, uh, sorry, encodes it on one side into what we call a code book. And this code book kind of, you can imagine that you end up with something like a representation in the middle and I'm oversimplifying this, but imagine you've got some sort of image and you've got these codes that sort of say, oh, well, this is a green tree and that's number one. And, you know, this over here, three is like a dog and this 53 down here is a person or something like that. And <clears throat> what it does is it learns to basically make these discrete representations in the middle of the network. And then on the decoder side, it blows them back up into uh, images. And because it's doing it from this discrete thing, it actually turns out that it works out, oh, okay, well, if I've got a tree and I've got a person and I've got a car or something, it kind of can work out how to... Uh, size them and how to do it so that it looks like something from the original uh, distribution that we were learning from. So this VQ uh, VAE idea um, really took off, you know, originally from DeepMind in 2017. Uh, it's, it's definitely a nice idea around sort of discrete uh, latent space versus sort of the continuous vector idea. Uh, it was used uh, in DeepMind for audio and speech in numerous papers. And then to be quite honest, they kind of, you know, just left it alone. They didn't really do much with it. Uh, and until OpenAI came and picked up, you know, this, this idea a couple of years ago. Uh, and sort of, you know, in 2020, 2019, 2020, OpenAI started doing this stuff with this VQ, uh, this VQ idea. So this vector quantization idea, one of the first places this appeared was in Jukebox. So this is a generative model for, for making music. And the idea is that you basically encode the music on one side and you get this little code book uh, inside. Now they actually do it at multiple frequencies and, and th things like that. So it's not just one simple thing, but what you do is you end up with this sort of code book of where some of the codes represent artists and some of the code represents style. So uh, if you, and I encourage you to do a search for OpenAI uh, Jukebox. I haven't got the link here, but uh, you can uh, find there's some great demos there of where you can do things like take the artist being Michael Jackson and the style being country music and then generate something out which will generate a song that sounds like Michael Jackson singing country music. Uh, and what they do is they also feed in these, uh, back then they were using the GPT-2 model for generating lyrics uh, and they would feed this in and it would you know, generate things out. And it is pretty amazing, uh, you know, the, the standard this could do. Uh, the fact that you could take an artist uh, and even take their own style and generate new songs in that style uh, and either give it lyrics or you use the, the sort of generative model to generate some lyrics as well. Uh, and it raises a whole bunch of issues around copyright, right? The, the, and I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, OpenAI and certainly Google haven't really sort of touched this too much is that no one really knows. Like if I, if I basically just learned the style of Michael Jackson, you know, do I have to pay royalties for that and then if I learn the style of country music in a certain artist is that you know something that's copyrightable or not so this idea is you know something that really uh um really took the, you know, this to the next step the idea of VQ vector quantization idea Be even beyond this the same authors then came back uh, to see uh, to, to do this model called DALI. So this is about a year ago, probably about 11 months ago now. And, and DALI, uh, you know, is using uh, a uh, image generation model, uh, but it's using that vector quantization idea in there. Uh, and then it can also be guided using something like CLIP to actually then generate images in a certain way. So you're starting to see these things come together.
uh, for this. Sort of the the and and this this uh, you know th this idea here is uh, this vectorization idea is still a really interesting idea. Um, I'll show you that the same authors now have moved on from this, though, uh, you know, in a more recent paper. Uh, but this idea was, you know, very cool in, in its time. Uh, and then sort of taking this idea even, even further is a model that just came out uh, last month, I think, from uh, Microsoft Research Asia. This is the newer visual synthesis pre-training model. And the idea is this is doing the same thing <coughs> where it's using this vector quantization idea. And... Uh, they train it up on a bunch of different tasks. So they actually do, I think it's pre-training on, uh, on three tasks, and then they fine tune on eight tasks. So I'm jump jumping around a bit, but these are the eight tasks that are fine tuned on. So you've got things like net, you know, video next frame prediction, uh, so that it can learn to sort of predict next frames for things. Um, it can do image manipulation. It can do, so this is doing it in an autoregressive, uh, you know, kind of way where it's filling it in uh, here. So you can see uh, that it can basically take half an image and fill in what it thinks the rest of the image would be. It can take a, a semantic segmentation map uh, and turn that into a real image and stuff. Um, this is definitely pretty, you know, cool of, of sort of what they're doing. The other thing this kind of, uh, that I found fascinating with this paper is, th is this example. So this, on the left here, we've got the raw video. And then here we've got different text prompt manipulations here. So we can see the diver is swimming to the surface and sure enough, the diver goes up, right? Uh, and then with the next one, the diver is swimming to the bottom and sure enough, the diver is going to the bottom, right? Uh, the third one is kind of even funnier. The diver is swimming to the sky. Uh, and sure enough, you can see that suddenly the whole air tank just disappears and it kind of becomes like an Ultraman or something like that. And we see that the bottom of the sea kind of turns into clouds there. So it is interesting that these models are kind of learning uh, some representations of even some of the things that we would think of as being kind of common sense. Like if we think about, you know, swimming to the surface, going up, swimming to the bottom, going down, uh, the models learnt, you know, at least in this example, to be able to do some things like that. So this is definitely an interesting um, perhaps artifact of this, uh, this whole process that's going to be interesting to see where going forward uh, with some of these things. So this was newer. Uh, this is from Microsoft Research Asia. Definitely worth, uh, you know, checking out. I, and this brings us to the, the next sort of generation I want to talk about. Uh, and this is NERF. So uh, NERF is, stands for Neural Radiance Fields. Uh, these are a thing that I came about, uh, we're looking at, under two years ago. Uh, so, and, and actually the funny thing was, I'll tell you sort of a, a, a funny story is maybe some of you know, Andre Kapathy uh, is the author of, sorry, is the, the um, director of AI at Tesla. Um, and I was, on, I was on a call with a paper reading call with him uh, one time, probably about a bit over two years ago. And the interesting thing was he made a joke that, oh, nowadays, everywhere I go, I just take my phone and I just take pictures of everything. Like, he said, because one day I feel that, like, we'll be able to turn it into 3D or something. And literally within, you know, a couple of months of him sort of saying that, uh, Nerf was out uh, and... I, you know, and did exactly what he was sort of describing. So you can see here that we're basically, what is NERF, right? We're, we're generating, we're getting, taking a bunch of input images and we're generating a, uh, so we're taking a bunch of these input images and we're, we're sort of generating a scene that we can sample, not just from where the, the original images were taken, but from anywhere around that scene. So we're actually rendering whole new views here. So uh, the, the idea here is that we're using, um, we're using a neural network to learn a scene from sparse inputs. Uh, the, the other thing here is that we're not actually um, we're actually doing what most people would think you don't want to do with a deep learning model is that actually we're overfitting on the scene. So it's not like one model can learn hundreds of different um, 
you know, scenes, right? You tend to use one model for one scene. Certainly, you know, where these things started was that. And what we do is we overfit the network to learn a scene, you know, in these weights. Um, and it turns out that this is a much more efficient way of storing uh, this information than trying to make some sort of 3D model or something like that. I, when they started out, this would take like 30, 30 minutes to 60 minutes to generate, you know, something really small, uh, like one of these. All right. So it wasn't super efficient at the start, right? Uh, it has speeded up probably by about two orders of magnitude, you know, since then. But this is some examples, you know, from this. Uh, so I can see someone's asking some questions. I... Uh, is NERF the same as uh, photogrammetry photogram for 3D models? Okay, I don't know exactly uh, what that is for 3D models. It's it's not really making a 3D model in the traditional sense of like a blender or you know something that like that is a 3D model. What it actually is doing? Um, let me see. Do I have any pictures? No, I don't have any pictures. Okay, so imagine that. Uh, imagine. Let's say we wanted to do my, my hand, right? Imagine that at each point, I, <clears throat> if I take a picture from over here, I, there's going to be a certain amount of, uh, of light reflection from there. And we tr we're training the, the neural network to be able to predict sort of the density and the amount of light reflection at that point. And actually for every other point along an uh, array. And then we're doing that for all the different rays. And it, so it turns out that when we've got a picture coming from this side and getting the ray there, and we've got one going from this side, these are going to be roughly the same. And so it can learn to then basically reproduce, see, you know, uh, views that it hasn't seen images for. And you can see that's what's going on here. I, so they... Um, you know, the, the, the idea here is that we're, we're basically sort of sampling, uh, you know, multiple views, but from this overfitted model. So let me just sort of, uh, I'll give you some uh, code to play with for this. I've just run this through uh, tonight. So here's, here's an example of, of an image, right? And you'll see that at the start, when we run this kind of thing kind of through, uh, it's going to be really bad. <clears throat> that it's not going to, you know, at, at, at early on, it's going to, you know, and it's doing it for all the images that it's got for this. I'm just sampling it from one view, uh, right? But it's actually generating from all the, the different views. Uh, and you can see at the start, it's just a blob, right? You know, it's not even a very good blob. And then but over time, given enough iterations, it starts to get that, oh, there are different colors in different parts. Uh, and there are different, you know, uh, things that are going on in each of these parts here. And then given, you know, given enough sort of uh, enough training, it can then start to get a lot more accurate at being able to do this. Uh, and each time that it's going through, it's basically predicting each point, uh, re re you know, sort of doing like a ray tracing kind of thing there. Um, it's, it's not a traditional sort of ray tracing thing because we're actually predicting at every point along the, the ray. Uh, so even the bits that are empty space, the model is kind of learning that, oh, that's, that's not going to reflect anything because it's just empty space. Right? And so you can see that just taking something like this, uh, okay, here we haven't trained it. This is not trained for too long at all. This is just a tiny sort of version. Um, but if we take that and we then basically render something out, uh, we can then you know, move some of these and we can then actually render out a video so you can see that that's definitely getting the 3D sense of it. Now, obviously, this is you know a much smaller version than the model you know in the paper, but it gives you an idea of like what's actually going on uh, with this kind of thing. Let me just go back to the presentation. So NERF is I. Uh, um, so I, I see a number of people are very interested in this. I, the, I, the, um, I, I don't know a lot about some of the 3D modeling stuff you're asking me about, so I can't really compare it exactly to that. I, I do know that this is the idea here is that this is definitely a much more efficient way of doing some of these things. And it's also, uh, it also allows you to do some really cool stuff. So th this, this paper, I think, was... A little bit about 
about two years ago, something like that, the original Nerf paper. Uh, and then Google followed up uh, later that year with this, this paper called Nerf in the Wild. So Nerf in the Wild um, is pretty cool, right? This is the Trevi Fountain in, in Rome, if you... Uh, I'm guessing quite a few people know that. Uh, and this, what we're actually looking at is, uh, is a lot of pictures that were taken, but they were taken from Google Photos. So you could imagine that Google Photos has thousands and maybe, you know, tens of thousands of photos of Trevi Fountain where tourists went there and took pictures at different times of the day. Uh, and you would have even seen like, you know, people standing in front of it, etc. And you can see that what this model is able to learn in this case is not only the scene from different viewpoints, but the scene from different lighting, you know, lighting over, over the day and stuff as well. Uh, so this is something that's, you know, really kind of cool uh, how it's done it. Now, what would have happened if there were people in front of it? If, the, if there was a person in front of it, you know, obstructing uh, there, um, they would have only been in one picture. So the model would have, would have learned that, okay, yeah, for that one picture, there was a reflection, you know, like there was a light point that would have bounced back at that point. But given thousands or tens of thousands of images, it's able then to sort of filter the people out. So they have a really nice example of this one. And they also have a nice example of the Brandenburg Gate. If you go and have a look at, you know, Nerf in the Wild, uh, there, that's one really cool. Um, so this idea is now making its way into other things as well. So at NRIPS, we saw this uh, be, uh, you know, being used for animation. So we can do things like where we can use uh, some sort of open pose model to do poses, and then we can generate uh, the sort of nerf from that, uh, and then basically, you know, translate this into 3D. And uh, and talking to the style gang guys, one of the things that, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of this talk came out of just chatting with these guys for an hour or so. I, um, one of the things that they were clearly interested in, and one of the things that they hinted at but obviously couldn't say straight out is that they see the future as being sort of like GANs for NERF and we've had DeepMind kind of do something like that with it at a very small scale uh, but I suspect that you will see you know uh, this team is going to release a paper probably in the next month or two there's going to be some sort of generative GAN take on a NERF idea and so this is sort of like a precursor to this sure enough um, after NERFs uh, NVIDIA released this. So NVIDIA is StyleGAN, for those of you who don't know. Um, and they released this. So this is, uh, uh, this is basically the, the, called the, you know, the instant uh, NGP or instant neural graphics primitives. And what this is doing is doing the same idea as a NERF, but it now allows you much more freedom to move right throughout uh, the, the different... Um, you know, the different scene here. So I've downsampled these uh, just to put them, them as GIF files in my presentation. If you look at the, the original um, one, especially this particular one, uh, it is amazing, right? You're looking at a 3D, uh, you know, a totally 3D world. It's very high resolution. I encourage you to go along and have a look at this link uh, and check it out. The other thing that I, you know, I, I sort of hinted at before, but uh, so we originally were at like 60 minutes to make, you know, 60, 30 to 60 minutes to do a model for a tiny little object. Uh, then we got it down to sort of like three to six minutes, uh, you know, and then it got down to sort of like 60 seconds on one of the papers. With this, this paper, it's down to six seconds for training the model uh, that can do the whole thing of this. So clearly NVIDIA is very bullish on this kind of generative model in that what they, they're sort of seeing is... Uh, my guess is that they can see that this is going to be used heavily in games, heavily in the metaverse, you know, all these sorts of, uh, you know, fancy, cool stuff that's coming. Uh, a lot of it will, will start using some of these things. And you could imagine that you've got one model that represents this whole street scene. And that model could be pretty tiny and put into a game. Uh, and that would allow you to fly around. Now, don't forget, we're looking at a particular path that, you know, is going, but you could have got, gone any path in there. Right, it didn't have to be this path. Uh, that it's not—it's not rendered just for one path. It's rendered for any path that you would take through this. So, uh, Nerf ideas, very cool version of um, generative ideas. How am I going for time? I'm, 
uh, conscious of time. Okay, uh, the last one that I want to go through tonight is another very cool idea, which uh, is starting to take off uh, and people are starting to talk about it. Uh, and this is um, the, the idea of diffusion models. So what is a diffusion model? So these things have, uh, these things have lots of uh, different um, names. This is one of the, the sort of downsides of some of this stuff is like GANs was pretty cool in that everyone just, oh yeah, GAN, 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 GAN. Um, diffusion models, often called denoise and diffusion probabilistic models, also called sometimes scoring models. Uh, they have, each of the papers tends to have a slight different take on it. Uh, and I would say we're almost at the point of working out some of the best ways to do it. Maybe not quite there yet, but, but pretty close to this. Uh, so if you think about a GAN, I'm just going to bounce back and forth with this. If you think about a GAN, right, we've got our latent noise. We take that latent noise, we feed it into, you know, some sort of upsampling model. And that's how we go from this sort of, you know, this 12 uh, dimension, 512 dimensional vector up to an image. <clears throat> so the... The diffusion idea is very different from this. Diffusion idea is much more like an auto encoder. So if you think back to, uh, you know, I'm guessing most of you who've done any sort of deep learning at some point have either seen or uh, used a auto built an auto encoder, right? And the idea is that you're the idea is you're predicting the same thing that you're that whatever you're putting in, you're predicting the same thing out usually, uh, and you've got some sort of bottleneck where you're getting it uh, smaller in the middle. So you've got this encoder on one side, decoder on the other side. Uh, and they were, they were one of the first things that deep learning sort of took off and, you know, people were kind of amazed and people kind of threw them away because they weren't that useful. They were useful for denoising certain things. They're actually quite good uh, in certain time series models and certain things where you need to um, deal with outliers and data and stuff like that. They can be really useful. Uh, but this idea of diffusion models has brought this all back. Uh, and it's kind of brought it back with a vengeance. So what it, this does is it basically says, right, we're going to start off with a nice image. And each step, we're going to basically add just the slightest amount of noise from, say, a, a Gaussian distribution. So we've got a nice Gaussian distribution. We're going to add a slight amount of additive noise. And we're going to normalize after each step as well. And then gradually, we're going to go from this image to something that is completely just noise. Right now, inside that noise, it turns out though that there are some patterns, maybe not patterns that we can see, but there are patterns that a neural network can then learn to do the reverse of this, where it can take the, the noise in and over many iterations, and I'm talking about a lot of iterations for some of these things, uh, often they will be uh, sort of at the high scale around 4,000 different steps and at the low scale, maybe 25 uh, for the particular paper I'm going to show you, low scale was 25, the high scale I think was 4,000 or 8,000. But at each step, it basically predicts the next image that would be slightly less noise. And you can see that we've got this noise thing there and we've got slightly less noise. And then gradually we get back to our picture of a dog. Now, he, like I said, you know, here we're doing it in, in 11 steps. Uh, in the real model, you're doing it probably, you know, uh, for thousands of steps. But the cool thing is your model then learns to be able to take all different kinds of noise and translate that noise into uh, something that becomes out uh, the other side, which is a, a really, you know, a, a sort of photorealistic image uh, in this case. And you can imagine that we can guide this noise just like we can do with the things that we saw. All the guided generation tricks that I talked about before, they can apply to any of these kind of models. So we can then sort of use this, uh, you know, as a way to take a loss against some sort of text or something else, you know, as we go through this. So the idea, let me just go back and make sure I've covered all this. So the idea is that we're, you know, where these diffusion models learn by breaking an image with noise and then rebuilding it from that noise. And the model learns to create the, the image over many, many iterations. 
right? What it actually does is that you end up with a model that you can then pass in a certain amount of noise and a certain time step to then predict the next time step. So I can sort of say, right, this is the noise after 387, you know, iterations um, give me the, the 388th you know, iteration uh, from this. And the model will then be able to you know, translate it as it goes through. So one of the papers at NRIPS uh, this past year was, uh, again, the same authors from DALI uh, and from Jukebox, from the OpenAI guys. Uh, and th th these two seem to do a lot of things together. Uh, and what they basically said was, well, what if we just do the diffusion idea on ImageNet. And so they basically uh, did exactly this, and it turned out that it actually is better uh, than, uh, than a GAN. You know, this, this style actually beats GANs at generating things on, on ImageNet. So uh, ImageNet GANs, especially any of them that have used some sort of ImageNet model, uh, you'll find that they often mess up the eyes really badly. Um, there are a lot of artifacts and stuff like this. Here you can see we've got a diversity of classes from ImageNet. I presume everyone knows what ImageNet is. Um, if someone doesn't, feel free to ask, uh, but I'm guessing that most of you do. Uh, we've got you know, a, a really good sort of diversity of things going on here. Uh, and I just realized I, I ran some code before without checking it too. So we're going to get a surprise in a sec. Um, all right. So we've got this. Uh, <clears throat> we can then uh, look, you know, compare this to other models. So the other, the sort of closest model to this uh, previously to the, before that style Excel GAN, the one that's just come out, you know, in the past couple of weeks or so, uh, would have been big GAN from uh, DeepMind. And if we sort of zoom in and look at this, we can see that Big Gan really messes up the faces, right? So this is the class of uh, a particular type of fish. And we can see that this is, this is getting fish and we've got variety and generation, but we've got some really weird characters here. Whereas when we look at the diffusion model, it tends to produce things that are much more realistic. And then we look at the real world data, we can see that, okay, this is actually from the training data. Uh, so you can see that, sure enough, the diffusion model is producing a better set of quality images here uh, than the, the GAN way of doing this. Um, and they have a number of different ways for doing this. There's some really nice tricks in there of what they'll do is they'll use labels to classify the normal and noisy versions uh, so that you can uh, then condition on a class that, okay, I want to take this noise and I want to generate... Uh, I want to generate the fish image or I want to generate the panda image. And the model is then able to work out, okay, now if I've got this kind of noise and I've got this class for panda, I need to create this kind of image of a panda. Uh, and that's what allows us to get nice, you know, variation uh, of what's going on in there. Um, and it can shift, what it actually does is it shifts the noise too. Uh, so it works out that, well, this, this bit kind of is panda-ish over here. So I'm going to push that up and expand that. And that's going to become my panda uh, from this. So this is a, a paper from, uh, you know, from NRIPS, a very cool paper that sort of introduced the idea of uh, these diffusion models for actually really big sorts of things. Um, the, taking it a step further, the same authors and you can see they sort of take it in turns to who, who's going to be first author for this. Um, they, they released a model and they, or they released a paper called Glide. Right? And what Glide is, if we think back to uh, Dali, one of the models I talked about before, uh, Dali was using that VQ idea uh, in the generation. What Glide is, and then was using Clip for guiding it with a text prompt, uh, what Glide is doing is exactly the same, except instead of the, the VQ idea, uh, we've got uh, the diffusion idea. So this is very similar to the DALI paper, except it uses diffusion, uses the exact same data set. Turns out that this is much less, and this is less blurry uh, than what you know, we've had before. Uh, and it can be guided with clip. Uh, so you can see that with this, you can actually then highlight areas 
uh, with a mask and sort of say, right, I want to change it, you know, uh, from uh, just a, 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 an empty field to, you know, zebras roaming in the field. And sure enough, it's able to generate things like that. I want to put a white hat on a guy uh, and it can do that, you know, quite easily. Um, let's actually have a look at the, uh, let's have a look at some code for this. Uh, so, oh, okay. So I ran this literally as we were setting up and we had a bunch of issues with the, the link. So I didn't, I forgot to come back and look at this. So this is a, a, a clip demo uh, of where, sorry, this is a glide demo of where we're using clip to, to generate it. And so uh, it, it's basically doing the diffusion stuff. We can set the, you know, the, uh, the amount of diffusion steps that we want to do, et cetera, and go through this. Uh, and we're using some pre-trained clip models that we can use for the uh, for an image encoder and a text encoder. And then we basically put in a text prompt. So the text prompt that I put in uh, and literally just ran it and forgot about it um, was an oil painting of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So I had no idea whether this is going to work or not. Um, so I'm basically saying, telling it to generate a batch of eight images of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. I've got some uh, different things to do with how much do we want to listen to the clip guidance and or not that we can sort of set in here. I, and you can see, sure enough, it will generate uh, images that are 64 by 64 pixels. Uh, these look pretty good for the Sydney Harbour Bridge, right? Uh, and then we can upsample these to be uh, 256 by 256. And we can see, sure enough, uh, you know, this is uh, turned out. And so I think I said, yeah, as an oil painting, yeah, an oil painting of uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. And you can see that definitely some of these look like uh, uh, an oil painting. Let's just try it. I, I think this I can do this. Um, what if we say something like a watercolour? I'm guessing they're going to use the US spelling, so I will put that in. Uh, Harbour Bridge, I've got... Let me just see how that's going to go. So th this is, ah, uh, oh, hang on. Okay, I, I need to run it all again. Um, let's let's let it run. Uh, uh, maybe I'll come back to it. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this at the end. Okay, so Glide is definitely, you know, one of the, the sort of most recent models. And this is, again, we're using this, what I want you to sort of see and hopefully take away from tonight is that it's still using the same sort of guided generation patterns. And that these things end up becoming uh, sort of components of where you just slot different things in and out. Uh, and that wasn't the case, you know, a couple of years ago, right? Uh, like, you know, each of these things now is starting to mature so that we kind of know like, okay, uh, if I want something where I'm going to have a text prompt involved, I probably want to use some sort of clip model in there. Uh, and I'm going to use some sort of text guided generation with, with the clip kind of thing going on. Um, so this is something that we, we can sort of look at. If we look at some of the conclusions, um, there are many ways, you know, many tools for generation now. I like, you know, there are ones that I haven't covered tonight, but I've tried to cover the, the main ones that I think are the most interesting. The other one that I, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk about is normalizing flows is also a really interesting thing, but it seems to have gone slightly a little bit of out, out of fashion. The diffusion stuff is definitely the hottest stuff at the moment. Um, uh, to give you a sort of idea of this, uh, one of the guys that I know from DeepMind uh, tweeted out uh, about a week or, or two ago, uh, you know, about GANs, something about GANs. And I casually asked him, so what do you think about diffusion models now? And I got an answer back like, oh, yes, you know, these things are really cool. Um, and then sure enough, he put out a, a blog post all about it. Uh, and and you know, pointing out some of the cool things that why are these things cool? Uh, they are getting much more, you know, sharper images. When we, com when we compare something like DALI uh, to the Glide, you'll find that DALI tends to be more sort of cartoon images, uh, you know, th that kind of thing, whereas uh, Glide will, will be much more uh, in the sort of sharp image, that kind of thing. Um, how's this going? So this is loading up a model. Okay, I'll come back to it. Uh, the 
so you're going to see that the, the other thing I, I would say is a key takeaway is that you're going to see these key components that keep popping up right? Uh, and I'll go through some of those components in a moment. And if you sort of get your head around those components, you will see them again and again and again. And when you go to read papers of this stuff, you'll sort of get a sense like, oh yeah, okay, they're doing that, the clip trick, they're doing this trick. And you can sort of work out, oh, okay, this is the new cool thing about this paper uh, and sort of hone in on that. Um, there are still areas that vary a lot. The VQ thing is really cool in some ways. Uh, and, it, you know, it's definitely... Um, it, it's it's definitely got a, a place, but the diffusion models is also cute, cool in a different way, and it, it's certainly you know starting to take the lead now. And then we've still got GANs, which are really useful tools, you know, for for generating images, etc. So, so just so, some of the components you should be aware of. Uh, we've got encoder decoder, right? So that's a common thing you're going to see in all these kind of models. Whether we've got you know uh, a vector quantized encoder decoder, well, you can even think of the diffusion thing as an encoder decoder in the way that it's doing it. Um, we've got the vector quantization and code books idea is popping up a lot. We've got the idea of doing things in steps. So the diffusion models and also the flow models, which I didn't get a chance to talk about tonight, also do things in steps and deal with, uh, they're dealing with distributions of data in steps. You've got the adversarial component, which is still a very strong thing that we see in GANs, et cetera. We're also starting to see, uh, you know, transformers make their way into these things. So all the things for the text, now, generally what you people are doing is encoding the sequences uh, of text with a transformer model. Uh, and they're also doing the same thing for images as well, that you can sort of pass a, a transformer, you know, pass an image into a VIT, uh, a vision transformer, uh, and get some really nice results out of those sorts of things. So uh, that, that sort of, you know, give you, gives, these are some of the key components we're seeing again and again. Um, variations. There's definitely uh, a bunch of different variations that people are still trying things out. Uh, the whole idea of distribution comparison. Uh, so uh, one of the ways it's become very popular is KL divergence, but people are trying out different ideas. Uh, another thing is taking different losses at different parts of the network. So like I showed you in the projected GAN where you're taking, you know, uh, you're, you're basically taking a loss at different parts in the network for that, but also in other models too, they're taking multiple losses and adding them together, maybe balancing them, et cetera. Um, you're seeing the whole idea of sort of uh, likelihood-based models versus implicit generative models uh, is something that's coming along too. What you should look out for uh, is that, you know, mashups, you're going to see uh, a lot of cool stuff, I think, this year in the idea of mashups is that people are now starting to realize, oh, we could take the VQ idea from here and the GAN idea from there. So, and that's, that actually has happened. There's a really good model called VQ GAN, uh, which uses some of the, the vector quantization ideas with a GAN. Uh, you, you've seen um, diffusion and, you know, stuff like this start to come uh, about. Um, like I said, I, I do think we're going to see over the next few months some really interesting stuff with GANs and NERF and maybe even sort of diffusion ideas and NERF as well. All right. So uh, let me just check back on our pals. Our, uh, still loading. Uh, these models can be pretty big. That's the, uh, you know, one of the... Um, the downsides with working with this stuff is that training it is usually going to be out of the realm of, of most people uh, sort of for training from scratch. You can certainly do a lot of fine tuning of these models uh, and get some good results there. Anyway, uh, in the, the, these, this is the slides. Uh, if you want to get the whole slides for, for tonight uh, and I've got links for all for the two notebooks, etc., cetera, um, and some stuff more this nice post about VQ, uh, VAEs, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, another thing is, if you're interested in, in this kind of thing, so we also run a meetup. Uh, we're in the same time zone, which is kind of amazing, right? That's very cool. Uh, we run a meetup called uh, Machine Learning Singapore. I, uh, my, myself and my co-founder and the company uh, started this in 2017. We have like 4,600 members or something. Uh, we run events at least usually every month. Uh, and we used to run them at Google. Uh, obviously, in COVID, now we've moved online. 
Um, so we, we sort of do a lot of stuff that's sort of cutting edge stuff like this, but we also do, uh, you know, more sort of general stuff. Um, one of the things that we actually do is we teach some courses and stuff with, uh, you know, for the, for the Singapore government uh, and do, and we've trained people from Google, from Facebook and, and this kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in, in sort of going to more meetups, right, if you want to come on, uh, I don't know what we're going to do for the next, I think for the next coming meetup, uh, I'm probably going to talk about some new stuff with Comvnets that's uh, that's out. Uh, but we, we generally have the two of us give a talk uh, and then we sometimes have guest speakers and stuff as well uh, for this. Questions. Um, if you want to reach me, you can, you know, email me or contact me on Twitter. But if people have got questions, I'm happy to go through. Let's have a look at our, how's our Sydney Harbour Bridge watercolour? Now that's turned out pretty nice, right? Uh, let's look at those. So you can see here, it's really got a sense of watercolors. That's that for me is very nice. And you can see also here the sort of composition of a watercolor is actually quite different than an oil painting, right? It's quite common, I guess, in watercolors to have you know just blank white parts. Uh, so we can see sort of that there. We've got some really nice colors going on there. Um, maybe we try uh, watercolor of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Oops. see how that goes all right so this this is the glide model uh it will generate it 64 by 64 and then it will uh, then we'll basically just use a, a simple super res uh model to up, up sample it uh for this okay questions um okay what is sam working on at the moment okay so i uh, um I think my, my co-founder is going to speak to you guys in a couple of weeks. He might show you a demo of one of the things we're working on. Um, we're working on, oh, look, there's with the fireworks. That's not bad. Not great, but not bad. All right. Um, that, oh, that, that one definitely is fireworks. Um, I, we're, so we're, we're working on, what are the things we're working on? Um, a lot of different things. Uh, so we do a bunch of stuff like the big thing we're, we're really bullish on at the moment is virtual people. Uh, so imagine instead of talking to a chat bot that you're actually speaking to uh, something that looks just like a real person uh, can read your face as well as your, your voice. Uh, and then you can basically have a conversation with it. Um, this is something that uh, we've been working on for the past couple of years. Uh, we've had some papers at, uh, at different conferences around sort of parts of this, and we're now sort of hoping to release this as a product uh, later this year. Um, so we're actually looking for sort of customer, you know, sort of trial customers for, for some of the things to do with that. Um, the other things that uh, we're working on um, is uh, we do some work for the Singapore government uh, that we can't really talk about that much, uh, but some of that, you know, is really interesting. We're also doing a bunch of training for the Singapore government uh, as well. Uh, so basically, you know, working with them, Singapore is very bullish on the whole AI thing. Uh, and so we've worked with uh, a number of people in uh, various, you know, uh, parts of the government uh, that are data scientists and training them up to sort of be AI engineers and uh, deep learning engineers. Uh, so that, that's sort of one of the key things. Uh, other questions? There's a question about is nerve the same as photo? Okay, so I don't really know what the, what the photo uh, I, yeah, I've lost that question. I'm just trying to scroll up and see it. Um, I, like, so you also asking about structure from motion. I don't really know uh, what structure from motion is. That sounds like it's something that's probably quite specific. I, I, the the I, you know the key idea with the nerf thing is that you're you're kind of doing like a ray tracing idea, like you do in um, you know in a game or something but you're fitting it into a neural network. Uh, and, and it, you know, and you are like, you're kind of breaking some of the rules because we, we all get taught, you know, oh, don't overfit models, don't overfit models. Um, the, uh, the, the, 
the, the thing that, you know, is that you're overfitting the weights, but it turns out the weights is just a much more efficient way of storing this. And we're literally just at the beginning of all of this. So like, like I showed you that, you know, instant uh, GP uh, model, um, I think that came out in January, uh, you know, I, yeah. Um, and, and from what I've heard from, you know, people inside NVIDIA chatting to some of these people, there's a lot of more cool stuff that's coming, uh, you know, that they're trying to sort of work at, that they're working on. Um, I know from Google, uh, so we have a lot to do with Google. Uh, I know that Google's working on, you know, similar sorts of things. You do find that OpenAI, if you know a little bit about the sort of ecosystem, OpenAI tends to do things that are very controversial, or you know to attract a lot of attention, like GPT three and stuff, but uh, Google and DeepMind and Nvidia and Microsoft will often have uh, just as good technology, if not better. But they're they're very hesitant to make the big claims that like OpenAI is is making. Um, so you know there, there's a lot of really interesting things that are going on like that. Uh, I think actually Martin is going to talk to you in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll talk about uh, DeepMind's retro model and the Google Lambda model, which are two language models that are very interesting, uh, you know, things that are going on there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, in regards to Nerf, it, it's definitely uh, something you want to sort of check it out. And literally, <coughs> it seems with every paper, the rendering times are just getting, you know, faster and faster and faster too. Uh, for this. Okay, what is ImageNet? So someone's uh, asking about ImageNet. Great. Okay. Uh, ImageNet is uh, originally a, a competition that was in uh, in the early 2010s. Um, and uh, someone's posted a, 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 um, a link. That's great. So ImageNet uh, is an interesting uh, data set. It was actually a data set, right? And a competition that was made. Uh, and it actually was made by some people who became quite famous later on. Um, one of them, uh, one of the authors on that paper is a guy by the name of Richard Socha, who went on to be the head of AI at, uh, at Salesforce, a lovely guy. Some of you may have uh, even seen him. Uh, he taught at Stanford for the NLP courses in Stanford for a while. Um, uh, he's now gone and started off his own startup. He's doing a whole bunch of really interesting stuff as well. Uh, the, uh, but ImageNet itself, what made ImageNet sort of so key was that you had this, this idea of like you've got a, you know, a million images, you've got a thousand classes, and you know, for the first time ever, people were able to predict uh, you know, build models that could get very high levels of accuracy. And when we say very high levels of accuracy at the start, they were sort of around 76, you know, no, sorry, for top one accuracy, uh, they were probably in the 50s to 60% accuracy. Top five was around 70 plus. Uh, and then gradually each year, it just got better and better and better. And it's also where the first place where deep learning had it's sort of major breakthrough uh, in that the, the previous scores that people were getting before deep learning, uh, you know, the, the error rate dropped by 50% when deep learning was introduced. This is also the first place that things like GPUs were used uh, for this stuff and, uh, and techniques like dropout, um, a number of sort of key techniques popped up in these ImageNet models. And so in 2012, you had, uh, you know, this, this model called the AlexNet model. Um, in 2013, you had Clarify, which basically uh, had a winning model that beat Google. So the AlexNet model um, was by uh, uh, Hinton, if you know who, who uh, Jeffrey Hinton is. Um, that led to him and his students selling a company uh, for $40 million to Google. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, you know, interesting things around that. Um, but each year, the models got better and better. After sort of, you know, 2017, 2018, eventually they abandoned the competition. Um, they abandoned the competition for a few reasons. One was because they'd already surpassed what the human level was. So I mentioned Andre Kapathy before, who was the, who, you know, is the head of AI at Tesla now. Um, Andre used to be, uh, at that stage, was a, a PhD student at Stanford. 
And so he decided, wouldn't it be great for us to know what is the human accuracy on ImageNet? And it turns out that ImageNet is actually quite tricky because even though you've got a thousand classes, uh, there's about 120 classes that are just dog breeds. So unless you know a lot about dogs, you, you know, I, I look at it and I'm like, yeah, that's a dog. That's a dog. That's a dog, right? Um, but so what he did was he sort of taught himself the dog breeds and then did it. And, and he tried to get a bunch of people in the Stanford AI lab to do this with him. But after people sitting there for like an hour of doing it, they were just like, yeah, forget it. I'm not going to do it. And so he worked out from himself, the human level being the Andre Kapathy level was about 5% uh, error rate uh, for a human. And, uh, and that's on top five. Um, deep net surpassed that, you know, uh, sorry, deep learning surpassed that a while ago. Uh, so uh, it got to the point where they decided to abandon the competition, but it's still a benchmark that is used for everything. And that data set is used for everything. So a lot of the GANs will train up on that data set to show how well they do on a standard data set. Um, but yeah, it's a good question for asking about that. Um, can you share more about the near future trend uh, of NERF and the metaverse? Uh, so I think that I, you will see um, the, the, you know, the metaverse uh, is, is marketing technology, you know, is sort of marketing term. Uh, you will definitely see a lot of interesting things uh, coming for, you know, some stuff like that. We're, we're also very interested in NERF for uh, rendering different things. Um, so you, you know, you'll probably see, uh, some big tech companies release glasses maybe late this year, early next year, uh, that allow people to do, you know, the whole uh, augmented reality thing. And you will then be able to use things like NERF and some other models to render things right in front of people in 3D. Uh, and there, there's a whole bunch of technologies around that. Um, but some of these things like NERF are actually starting to get that to be really good. Um, you mentioned earlier, not many industry use case yet. So particular barriers. Okay, so that, that was more about the GANs in that the GANs, uh, the GANs originally didn't have a lot of use cases in, in the wild because they required a lot of data to train. They were quite hard to train them and stuff like that. Um, you can actually use them for uh, data augmentation. Uh, there are certainly some, you know, tricks that you can do for, for that kind of thing. Uh, we're seeing now with like the Galgan, you know, version two, that that's clearly going to get a lot of use in industry in that people can take a trip, you know, pre-trained model. Uh, and you could imagine you could have a pre-trained model, for example, on furniture that's just trained on a million images of furniture. And then you could say, right, I want to design a piece of furniture and I want it to, you know, I want it to have this shape and I draw that and I tell it, but I want it to feel like, you know, fur or something and it will render, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so you'll see a lot more things like that. Previously, GANs were used a lot for um, the, the things like style GAN were for, um, uh, for facial recognition models. It's very hard to get facial recognition models. And then for certain organizations, generally the data sets and, and the models for, for facial recognition either tend to fall into being Western or Chinese, meaning that the, the model was trained on Western faces, is very good at Western faces, not so good at Asian faces or you know, any sort of indigenous face, something like that. Um, and then you've got the Chinese models, fantastic on Chinese uh, faces, not so good on you know, other faces. So one of the things that, uh, that we saw that worked quite well for fine tuning these models <coughs> was to go into a style GAN and generate up you know, the different uh, ethnicities that we wanted and you know, that kind of thing. So that's something that you can uh, do. You know, but there weren't a lot of uh, uses for that is what I was sort of saying. Uh, have you started working on uh, AI in Metaverse? If you have, can you share a bit? And um, so definitely what we're working on would, could be considered as part of the Metaverse. We don't really think that much about the Metaverse per se. What we're interested in, if you know the, the, um, if you know the TV show Westworld, uh, we're big fans of Westworld. And we think the only thing that Westworld got wrong is that it won't be, you know, it probably won't be in person for a long time to come. It will be virtual. So it will be in AR and VR. Uh, so uh, that whole thing of sort of rendering, you know, realistic people 
uh, is one of the things that um, uh, that we're uh, we're doing. Maybe I can find a demo. Let me just quickly look for something. Uh, um, so that that's something that we're we're definitely interested in, uh, and. You know that that that's something that we we've sort of seen that like okay you know it's we're on the the, the verge of uh, a lot of things coming through. Uh, SE ImageNet has been around for 10, 15 years. Uh, so the original ImageNet paper was in twenty oh nine. Yeah, okay. So yes, someone's answered the the ImageNet question. Yes, I, um, originally it was based on a, a a data set of words too that went with it, but that never really took off. I, what are the next upcoming conferences where work on generative models will be presented? Um, so there are a number of different conferences that are coming up. We, we've got ICLR coming up uh, in about you know, six weeks, eight weeks time. Uh, we've got the CVPR, which are the, all the visual conferences. Uh, there's a, a number of those sorts of things coming up. Uh, so you will certainly see you know, uh, new stuff. And you'll find that, that uh, the companies have to release their their papers. So normally you submit a paper sort of four to six months before the actual conference. So some of the things I've shown you tonight will be in conferences over the, the next few months. And then things that get released, you know, over the next month or two will be, uh, you know, sort of uh, probably the, over the next three months would be things for NRIPS at the end of this year. Uh, so the conferences themselves trail a little bit behind the uh, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, thoughts on most promising applications five years out. Okay, five years out. That's <laughs> like, uh, so I guess the only thing I can think about is going five years back. Uh, five years back uh, would have been, um, you know, five years back, uh, 2017, at that stage, GANs were just starting to take off. And everyone was really bullish on these things, and they've definitely gone sort of beyond even what I thought they would get to. Uh, one of the biggest things that we've seen in the past five years is also uh, AutoML, or you know, the, the the idea of neural architecture search. So using an, uh, a deep learning network to build another deep learning network. This is still hugely um, successful for a lot of things, uh, and Google's doing a lot of things with that. Uh, as products and stuff like that to basically you know make it easier for people, etc. Um, five years out from now, uh, definitely everything will be multimodal. Uh, so you will see that like you know we've gone mostly for images or text or things like that. In the future, we'll have everything. Uh, you know, I think you'll find that even things like audio, uh, visual, uh, text, all will start to be uh, combined in models. Uh, and not just for generative models, but for, for sort of classification models, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, I think we will see some really interesting advances. We will definitely see, you know, deep learning make a huge impact on health. Uh, DeepMind is already working on that a lot uh, and has really done some amazing stuff uh, with things like AlphaFold, AlphaFold 2. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if we're going to see, you know, reinforcement learning pay off more. Uh, that's something that, you know, that uh, reinforcement learning can do amazing things, but then it's still like, you know, maybe it hasn't delivered on, on what people have promised a lot for it as well. Uh, but we, we will see, you know, uh, definitely a lot of interesting stuff over five years. Uh, how do we extend techniques into 3D? Uh, my understanding of NERF is that, it, it, uh, it's, that it's not general. So it, meaning that it, it's, not a, it's not a generalizable model. Like we don't use the one model to, to train for lots of scenes. We tend to use one model to train for render a specific scene, yes. Um, so the, the idea of rendering dynamic scenes this is a really interesting idea. Uh, and this is something that DeepMind has worked on with just small objects of where, you know, you can render objects that actually don't exist in the real world and then use, build sort of like a NERF model around something that doesn't exist. Uh, that I think you're going to see a lot more of this year. Uh, that's something we'll definitely see a lot more of this year. Uh, 
And any thoughts of ML development in Asia versus o Oceania? Uh, so I really don't if, you know, know what's going on in Australia at all. Um, I have you know, some friends there and stuff like that, but I, I don't, you know, there's definitely a lot of talented researchers there. Uh, I know that Google's starting to invest more, uh, you know, to do, uh, you know, I think Google Brain is opening up there. I, so that I'm not sure about. I, generally, for most things in deep learning now, it's becoming China versus, you know, America. I, you know, that, that is definitely true. I, and you're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of the really cool stuff starting to come out of China often more than it is coming out of America. Uh, that uh, is something, you know, I, I think one of the things is they just have a different view about data also, you know, the, the uh, ethics around data and stuff like that is quite different. Uh, um, I know uh, Google flew me up to China in end of 2018, something like that, and I... Uh, talking to a lot of the, the local guys there, um, I was amazed at like, you know, how far they, they, they've they come along and what they're, and I'm not talking about sort of like top class researchers, I'm talking about young kids, like just talking to kids who've just come out of university and stuff uh, and they're really doing amazing things. Um, so in, in sort of Southeast Asia, uh, I think probably similar to Australia, you're seeing, you know, people are starting to realize that this stuff can be really useful uh, and can be, you know, can certainly make products and stuff like that a lot better. Um, one of the courses that we teach is uh, deep learning for product managers. And we've seen a lot of people be very interested in that, of sort of learning uh, that not the technical stuff as much, like we teach a little bit about building models, but uh, for that one, it's more aimed at, at product managers who want to know what's possible, what's not possible, and then how can they, you know, uh, what they would need in data, what they would, you know, learning how to sort of build an AI product is a very different kind of product than what most people kind of, uh, you know, see for that kind of thing. Um, and and th we, that's something that we sort of see is popular in both in Asia, but also in the West as well. Um, diffusion model sounds cool. Wonder whether it's been applied to non-image training data. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but diffusion models are also making their way into speech systems. So we do a lot of with a lot of stuff around TTS or text to speech, uh, and some really nice. Just you know, past couple of weeks, there's been some nice papers from uh, Tencent in China come out using diffusion models for TTS systems. Uh, so that, that you're definitely going to see that more. <clears throat> and it wouldn't surprise me that you see something like, uh, you know, the jukebox using diffusion from OpenAI soon as well. I think that's it. Uh, if there's more questions, I'm happy to answer them. But. That's really cool. Is there any more questions? We can have uh, one more question, one more last question. Yeah, please open your mic if you want to uh, ask questions. But it's been a really good, yes, any questions? Maybe I can ask people a question. I'm curious, <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I was asking the organizers just sort of, you know, who are the people on the call and what, what do you guys do? So I'm curious to sort of know, like, what, what sort of uh, ML are people working on or deep learning? Do you do it in your day-to-day -day job? You know, what sort of kind, are you all working on recommender systems? Are you working on, you know, what do you guys do? <coughs> if people want to just type something in, it's just... See, everyone's getting really quiet now. Uh, yeah, and exactly. Feel free to open your mic. Yeah, I, I guess that's one of the cool things about being on the meet system. Uh, computer vision for pathology. Okay, that's definitely uh, definitely something where deep learning is being used a lot. Chip design. Okay, so we've trained some people from Infineon, uh, um, and I know and. and and yeah, chip design is definitely something also that Google's very interested in. Uh, and you're actually saying, so I don't know, uh, Sean, whether you you probably know it already, but uh, Google released a really uh, big paper about using um, reinforcement learning for chip design recently. 
3D structure from motion for shipwrecks, but not using ML and DL. So now that's really interesting. Like uh, that's something that maybe you could use the nerf thing eventually for some some things like that. Uh, you know that that might be uh, something that you could do. All right, it's cool. Yeah, it's cool just to hear what people are doing. I, I'm always uh, interested to sort of know, okay, what people are working on, what they're, what things that they're interested in using deep learning for. Um, Martin and, and myself, my, my co-founder, uh, we've trained probably you know a few thousand people in deep learning now around the world. Um, I did a stint in New York. Uh, we've trained for, for Google. We've trained on on in the West Coast and stuff as well. Uh, and we sort of see that like, it's really cool when someone's got some domain knowledge and then learn sort of the deep learning skills to go with that and then apply that and get, you know, amazing results. So that's something that's really cool. Uh, now for the near future wants to decent initial point clouds, cool. Okay, applying NLP to investigate job trends. Okay. Uh, NLP is something that we've worked on a lot for for people. That's 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 definitely the area that's probably you know one of the the hottest sort of key things now that just wasn't working as well four or five years ago, and suddenly now with transformers is working amazingly well. All right. Anyway, I thank you. I think you know I. Um, I'm certainly happy to, you know, answer questions. If people want to email me or anything like that, um, like I said, if you if you are interested, to go to more meetups. Feel free to join our meetup. We do uh, events there. Uh, but it's it's cool just to, to sort of meet people from different places. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Sam. It's been really interesting, like a talk this evening. And then I've been uh, receiving a lot of uh, good feedback from people uh, through the, uh, through the um, what is it, the survey. Uh, some of them like, have already filled out. If you haven't filled out, please do fill out. Uh, so, and um, yeah, as Sam said before, uh, we actually uh, are going to have another meetup with Martin. Uh, Martin is like uh, Sam's uh, co-founder for uh, Red Dragon AI. And uh, yeah, it will be, we are looking forward to, and uh, we're going to inform you later in regard to the meetup. And then the other thing is like, I would just want to thank you for Sian and Sarada for the collaboration and for uh, hosting, co hosting this event. And um, yeah, it's been really great to, work with you guys and uh, hopefully we can work more in uh, other meetups and uh, there are different kinds of options that we have now and uh, you guys uh, specifically in the machine learning yes and then uh, Sam also has a event in um, in in Singapore as well so it's it's a free world and everyone can uh, learn more every day and at uh, GDG, as for all of you here, like uh, we hosting a lot of different kinds of technology meetup and also uh, um, a lot of uh, different types of uh, Google uh, uh, events. And then we are uh, looking for collaboration with uh, different kinds of communities as well. Well, uh, before we go, can we... Uh, can I ask everyone to maybe perhaps like would whoever left here, if we can take a picture together, is it possible? And let me just say thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for you having uh, coming today and it's been a bit late, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. Sam, I just want to say like thanks for your huge enthusiasm. You know, that was that was uh, a really great run through the, the, the kind of whole field of GANs, which is um, which is great. Your energy throughout that was was absolutely awesome, and you stayed on point right the way through, which was brilliant. So, thank you again. That was a great talk, and uh, yeah, Dr. Sarah, thank you for putting that together. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate you uh, bringing in the resources to to do that. So, yeah, thanks again, guys.
Let's see what. Thank you so much, Sam. And uh, yeah, so let's take a picture together when we're here. <laughs> okay, let's do it. One, two, three. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sam. I'm looking forward to talk more with uh, Martin. And uh, thank you, everyone. Oh, okay. Let's take another picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, it's good to have another girl here. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everyone. Have a good night and uh, stay safe and healthy. Bye. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Nis. Bye, everyone. Have a great night.